So, Topun Mundul, sir, are you there? And Nambo? Yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, good evening on behalf of IPS West Bengal branch. Uh, I will welcome Dr. Sunil Banerjee, who has accepted our invitation to deliver a lecture on clinical use of antiarrhythmic drugs. So in the first class, we have already discussed the clinical, uh, not the clinical use, that is a pharmacological perspective of antiarrhythmic drugs, and which was delivered by the renowned teacher and scientist Professor Rabindranath Chattavata. So this is the unique class today, which will be delivered by our beloved and respected Dr. Suni Banerjee. So again, I will welcome all the delegates, participants, our students, teachers, and all the members who are attending today's program. So over to Dr. Sambo. Thank you, sir. So now I request Professor Lopamudra Choudhury, we are really happy uh, that uh, she had agreed to chair the session on this uh, clinical use of antiarrhythmic drugs from physician's perspective. So uh, welcome you, madam. Madam had done oh, her DA and MD in pharmacology. And now currently the professor at the Department of Pharmacology at Archikor Medical College in Kolkata. She is also the Vice President of Indian Pharmacological Society, West Bengal chapter. So welcome you, madam. So please uh, proceed for, for today's session. A very good evening to all. And thanks to IPS West Bengal uh, chapter for giving me the opportunity to be the chairperson of today's session. And I hope it will be a very interesting session because it is a follow-up of uh, after the mind-blowing session taken by uh, Professor Arin Chatterjee, mm -hmm. sir, regarding the pharmacotherapy of uh, antiarrhythmics. It will be a very good, uh, interesting chapter to as a continuation. And we, um, today's, regarding today's uh, session, and we, Really, uh, we are honored to have uh, Dr. Shuni Banerjee, sir, with us. And he's, uh, as we know, and he's uh, the senior uh, interventional uh, cardiologist at Ruby um, Hospital. And uh, he will give his experiences regarding the uses of antiarrhythmic. And uh, sir, um, we welcome you to our session. And uh, you can continue, sir. You can start the session. Thank you. Thank you, all uh, Sir, I, I think the network bandwidth becomes low Am from I your side, sir. So uh, can you please... Uh, close your video so that we can uh, get some broadened uh, this sound. Yes, sir. Sir, can you hear us, sir? Yeah. Now it's better? Yeah, it's better now, sir. Thank you. Uh, so what was being discussed in earlier sessions? So in earlier session, it was about that uh, pharmacology of antiarrhythmic drugs. Fine, fine, uh, fine. So we are, okay. we are keen to know about that clinical uses of antiarrhythmic drugs from you. Sir. Okay, thank you. So uh, before I start, I'll tell you that there may be some overlap between his lecture and my lecture, but uh, uh, there is no harm in because you, you cannot just uh, in uh, isolation discuss this uh, problem of antiarrhythmic drug. So I'll uh, try to be specific uh, and uh, focus on these issues. Thank you. 
So uh, first of all, uh, then I uh, divide my lecture into two groups. Please allow me to share first. Yes. Now, uh, before we uh, start the thing, we need to understand some basic issues. Like in this ECG, what we see very clearly that uh, there is a rapid uh, rate in the ventricle and uh, no obvious P wave you can see very clearly. And uh, if you see this uh, thing, then you have two things in your mind that you don't get any P wave and you find a QRS which is uh, faster, uh, then it might be a ventricular tachycardia or supraventricular tachycardia. And this is the supraventricular tachycardia. Why I am saying so? The explanation is in the next slide. So you need to measure the QRS complex. And as you know, in this ECG, every small QRS is 0 0.04 second, millisecond. So uh, or 40 millisecond or 0 0.04 second. So if you have uh, more than uh, three square uh, of uh, QRS duration, or at least three square, you can definitely say that this is a white QRS tachycardia. And uh, if it is narrow, then it is a narrow QRS tachycardia like this. So here also we can see something which is called a P wave like picture, but not the P wave. So if you see in a, uh, from the artistic point of view, this is something called a short tube appearance. So it is a atrial flutter with a control ventricular rate. Now, what has happened, the ventricular rate, although is uh, rapid, I will not say control, but it is fixed ventricular rate. So that means that uh, there is a pattern in uh, this sort of arrhythmia and this is called re-entry arrhythmia. And we need to understand what do you mean by re-entry arrhythmia. Now, uh, these are the mechanism of arrhythmia. So uh, when we are discussing about the arrhythmia today, we'll be discussing mostly on the tachyarrhythmia, but not the bradyarrhythmia. So tachyarrhythmia means, as you know, more than 100 per minute, it's called tachycardia. And most common cause of tachycardia is the sinus tachycardia in clinical practice. But what, apart from that, you have to know the background between the tachycardias. So like uh, if you have a uh, severe anemia, anxiety, you have an enhanced automaticity of the pacemakers, which has been situated in the heart. And that can increase the heart rate. And this is called enhanced automaticity. And uh, they actually don't respond to the electricity. That means giving an electrical shock doesn't give a benefit. Rather than there is a more common cause of tachycardia, which is called reentry tachycardia. And what the reentry tachycardia exactly means is uh, been beautifully depicted in this picture. So uh, reentry tachycardia is something where you have parallel two electrical system. One is rapid and another is slow. So uh, a abnormal electrical activity interferes in between this normal electrical circulations. And they do a circus movement like that of what happens in circus in earlier time in a trapeze play that it's swinging from one side to another side. And the trigger dysarrhythmia is a very difficult uh, to explain uh, until unless you show you the diagram. And this is the other cause of arrhythmias. Now, you have to uh, know that there are multiple uh, uh, way you can uh, treat them. And the most important way to treat uh, those arrhythmia is by uh, pharmacological cardioversion. So what do you mean by pharmacological cardioversion? That means you give some drug and they can acutely convert. And this is uh, particularly 
being tried for uh, AV reentrant tachycardia or narrow cure is tachycardia. For ventricular tachycardia, the only drug which are approved is lidocaine and uh, uh, amiodarone in the acute stage. Uh, lidocaine is being less used these days rather than amiodarone is more commonly used, but still in ventricular tachycardia in acute setting, particularly after a myocardial infarction, we try to give uh, lidocaine. And uh, non-pharmacological, the most important thing is the electrical shock. And if there is a myocardial stunning, you give artificial pacemaker. And if the patient survives in the long term, if they are appropriate candidate, we give them a intercardiac defibrillator. Surgical ablation is definitely the new concept uh, for atrial fibrillation, but for ventricular tachycardias and others, it's still not been picked up in the last few decades. So these are the not sell the treatment which is available for uh, treatment of arrhythmia. But before that, although it has been discussed in several times, we need to focus this thing until and unless we focus this uh, picture, we'll not be able to understand why medicine we should use and why we should use. The most important thing is uh, the heart has pacemaker in the sinoatrial node, in the AV node, in the his Parkinson's system, in the ventricle and atria. So there are multiple parties, uh, political parties in a system. This is like this. So who gets the majority is governed by the ruling uh, party. So he will be the ruling party. So sinus uh, node is always the ruling party. Others are not the ruling party until and unless sinus node fails to act appropriately. And why it is so? Because if you can uh, enter sodium into the muscle cell, you can easily activate SA node with a 50, uh, minus 50 millivolt of voltage. Whether, where in AV node it is 60, and in ventricle and the atria it is 60, 70, 80, something like that. So that means, that it is very easier to activate the SA node with a little bit increase in sodium entry. And this phase is called the rapid depolariz depolarization of the cell membrane. And as you know, the cardiac muscle doesn't get fatigue until and unless it is terminally ill, heart, or acutely ischemic. So they continuously work. And uh, the most important first stage is the uh, depolarization and followed by the phases of depolarization, which we'll be discussing several times in my lecture. And that is important to understand the mechanism of these medicines. Now, uh, so what happens that uh, this is called rapid depolarization where the sodium rushes into the cell. And as you know, the concentration of sodium in the blood is much higher than that of potassium 140 vis-a-vis around four. So uh, milli equivalent per liter. So when the sodium enters, it activates the muscle. And as I told you, the sinus node is the first to be activated because it can be activated with just minus 550 millivolt of uh, achieving the resting potential. Whether the ventricle or the atria, they need 70 or 80 millivolt of minimal voltage to peak the action. And that's why they are the leader. The, when the sodium entrance, and then the next thing what happens that sodium channels gets inactivated and the potassium uh, try to go out. And then there is some slow phase. So remember one thing, this is just a cardiac cycle of uh, 0.5 of diastole and 0.3 millisecond of Systole. So this is part of less than 0.3 millisecond we are talking about. And then there is a plateau situations where the cell becomes less permeable to sodium until and unless you have a phase three where the sodium gate is closed. That means there is no more sodium can enter into the SA node or other active pacemaker areas. And the potassium also leaves rapidly in this plateau phase or in the, in the rapid depolarization phase. 
And when it comes to a resting position, then there are two, three things happen. The resting membrane potential increases from minus 80 to 70 or 50, and then the sinus node again get activated. And here, what happens? The potassium goes out and calcium also goes out and the sodium get again opens and the sodium comes in. So this mechanism of action potential is primarily a concept which you need to understand in the bedside when you are treating the patients. Now, as I told you that we have to discuss this uh, form, even if it wasn't discussed earlier, because this is very relevant with the uh, concept of antiarrhythmic drug. So there are uh, multiple classes of drug. So do we actually uh, remember when we prescribe this is a class one, class two, class C, class two or three or four years? We need to remember very clearly and that's why it is important that it, this algorithm should be there always in our mind. So let's say what uh, class one they do. They increases the effective uh, uh, repolar, uh, action potential duration. That means rather than becomes a steep, it becomes slow. And the effective refractory period, that means when the further impulse cannot do anything is also get prolonged. So this seems to be a very promising action if you have a rapid ventricular rate. So let's see who are the class 1A drug. So class 1A drug, they block the sodium channel first as a moderate degree, as I showed you. And the name is quinidine, procanamide, and disopropanamide. So uh, this drug seems to be a little bit uh, reason because we don't use this drug. Why don't we use this? Quinidine has a notorious effect of producing autoimmune hemolytic anemia. It can produce skin rash, and there are many other notorious effects. The dose at which quinidine is effective is very difficult to give clinically. So I tell you very clearly, I don't have any experience of using quinidine, and it is difficult to get. Although there was a, a medicine which was being earlier uh, available in market, the name of which was natcardine that contains quinidine along with phenobarbiturate. So phenobarbiturate used to decrease the central sympathetic stimuli and quinidine probably decreases the sodium entry. And the patient who has recurrent hepesis would be treated with quinidine, but it is no more used. But procanamide and diisopyramide definitely being used. Now quinidine, I don't say that it is not used, the ECG, there is a pattern which is called a Brugada syndrome. There is a ST elevation in V1 and V2, but the patient doesn't have any chest pain and the R wave is preserved. And this Brugada syndrome is seen in the part of European, uh, Asian countries, Thailand and the surrounding areas. It has a familial genetic predisposition and where uh, you can have a sudden cardiac death or recurrent ventricular arrhythmia. Now the treatment of Brugada syndrome is the implantable cardiac defibrillator, but suppose somebody gets a frequent episode of this uh, electrical burst, then the device is going to be exhausted. Then it is a good idea to add quinidine and quinidine can be procured on these populations. The true incidence of uh, uh, Brugada syndrome in India uh, better can be addressed by the expert electrophysiologist, but I rarely have seen uh, in Indian Heart Journal or in, in the American Association of Physicians of India journal uh, about Brugada syndrome's case report. So they, this is really less common in our country. But more importantly, you need to understand the procanamide and diisopyramide still being used. And diisopyramide is being produced in a case which is called a hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy in combination with beta blocker. Why? Because it decreases the force of cardiac contractility by virtue of 
delaying the action potential and increasing the effective refractory failure. So as you know, the hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, the more hypercontractile like the ventricle is, the more the patient is symptomatic. And that's why the beta blocker or verapamil, which decreases the heart rate at the cornerstone of therapy, but, uh, and the symptoms really is like angina dyspnea. But in selected patient, if you give diazopyramide, which is available in the form of Nordpest, which again is very difficult to say, that's why I am saying that in my lecture, I will be talking many uh, drug, but which actually we are not using in day to day practice. And this also produces dying out, retention of unit, some anticholinergic effect is there. Procanamide can be used, yes, how? So it's a very clinical useful tool that as I told you that Brugada syndrome may not be very common in Indian country, but we need to see the patient in the lab by giving procanamide intravenously and to see whether the patient gets a Brugada syndrome like ECG pattern. And so procanamide can unmask the Brugada syndrome. So it is not a treatment for Brugada syndrome, but it is a treatment uh, Diagnose Brugada syndrome. But procanamide is recommended to restore sinus rhythm in patient with WPW in whom atrial fibrillation occurs with hemodynamic instability. So, WPW, if first time manifested with atrial fibrillation, produces white QR stachycardia and irregular. Remember one thing that the only cause of a white QRS tachycardia, which is looking like a ventricular tachycardia, but which is irregular, you have to suspect it is a WPW with actual fibrillation, which is a very bad medical emergency. And actual treatment is procanamide, uh, but uh, the issue is it is not used in clinical practice. So most of the time we uh, terminate them with uh, electrical cardioversion, and then in the long term, they can be given procanum. Now, uh, coming to class 1b. So 1b decreases the action potential duration and also decreases the effective refractory period. So do you think it is going to be effective? It is going to be effective in limited cases where uh, the action potential has been suddenly prolonged and it happens in the face of acute ischemia. So let's, uh, let's see who are the class 1B drug. The class 1B drug are lidocaine and mixolytic. So what happens that lidocaine, as I told you, that it is given mostly in patient with a, uh, acute myocardial infarction and secondary ventricular tachycardia. Mexilidin is given in patients who are refractory to uh, refractory to other antiarrhythmic drugs and uh, they have a baseline QT prolongation. So if you have a baseline QT prolongation and how do you know QT prolongation? The single answer is take a caliper or a small piece of paper, mark the RR interval, and the QT interval has to be half of the between these RR intervals. So here one, two, three, four. So QT interval should be up to this, but here the QT interval definitely is prolonged than that. So this is called QT prolongation. So if you have this thing, never used amiodarone or sotalol, which we are going to discuss in next uh, slides, or never uh, uh, treat the to try to find out hypocalcemia or hypomagnesemia and lidocaine and mixolytin is the drug of choice to prevent this. The drug uh, is, uh, so in long QT syndrome, this definitely being, uh, can be given and in patient with recurrent intracardiac uh, ICD related arrhythmia, that means if the patient getting too much also. QT prolongation normally happens because of Electrolyte intervals because of the multiple drug, you know, pharmacologist or the physician should know that which are the drug which produces QT prolongation, but more commonly 
in today's scenario patient with hiv who are taking ketoconazole or other antiviral drug and patient taking erythromycin or a primitive anti allergic drug due to this covid environment all can produce qd prolongation and we have to have a close vigil on these cases particularly they have if associated structural cardiac disease it can be a dangerous consequences so uh, in these cases uh, you have to shorten the qt by uh, correcting those abnormality a medicine is definitely class 2b is one of the options now let's see what is class 3 1c 1c actually prolongs the this is a wrong uh, the statement uh, i have copied it because they have actually uh, probably made a exchange of class 3 to class 1c so it uh, increases the uh, excess potential duration but the uh, erp that is effective refractory period is uh, not increased so if the effective refractory period is not increased uh, then the chances of qt prolongation or proarrhythmia should have been decreased but what happened in the clinical practice is that the drug flecronide and propofenol not propofenol propofenol they causes marked degree of sodium blockage and no effect on qt prolongation so let's see the previous slide once more so marked decrease in sodium uh, entry into the abnormal muscle remember these things are being discussed not on the esenodol it is on the muscle which are abnormally reacting so when you are talking about ventricular arrhythmia this is parkinji fiber or the ventricle where this medicine is uh, acting so what happens these drugs are reasonable for a uh, patient uh, with uh, ventricular tachycardia without structural heart disease or ischemic heart disease because there was a cat study where this flecainide and canide has been given and they have found that that increases the chances of sudden cardiac death although they do decrease the premature ventricular contraction and this is probably because this uh, decrease in uh, or not being allowing the qt prolongation to increase they invited new ischemic episode in patient who has a structural heart disease just trying to explain you it has it has extended the action potential duration but the recovery has not been increased that means the chances of ischemia in the cell has increased and that is the reason although uh, it's conceptually looks like a good antiarrhythmic drug this flecainide and propofenol and still it is being used we to very much use flecainide for acute conversion of atrial fibrillation and if the patient is a, uh, atrial fibrillation being controlled with a 200 mg of dose we so many a times give 50 mg twice daily of flecainide provided there is no left anterior hemi block or white qrs in that case you need to have a pacemaker support but if a patient has a post previous myocardial infarction if a patient has a dilated ischemic cardiomyopathy we don't give propofenol or flecainide flecainide we are discussing because propofenol is less commonly used it is it is not being marketed very frequently propofenol is available as pradil by mk or pharma and flecainide is being uh, marketed as flecaride by torrent pharmaceutical pharma now uh, we come to the class 2 so class 2 is not worried about this business of sodium entry calcium out so they do a very unique uh, thing they increases the slope of depolarization that means you decrease the activation of the rapid depolarization and it also increases the prolonged depolarization of the av node so let's see which is the drug which can be and this is the drug which we use uh, daily evening uh, every day in our clinical practice and this is a beta blocker so beta blocker that's why 
are most important in patient with inappropriate sinus tachycardia or in a high anxiety state and patient with paroxysmal persistent or permanent atrial fibrillation to decrease the ventricular rate. Now, uh, therapy of beta blocker is associated with the reduction of adverse cardiac event for long QT interval and catecholamide during polymorphic VT. That means there are young people who come with recurrent syncope after a simulchannel excitement and a ventricular tachycardia, but the structurally there is normal heart. So this is less commonly seen, but these days this can be seen in patient who is of with acute stress or with drug toxicity, drug abuse. In patient with a symptomatic PBC, so there are a lot of patients who come, sir, my beat is missing, what I am going to do? Don't give amiodarone, don't give flaconide or uh, mexalidine. Those are costly and uh, has a long-term partial and side effect. So you can give safely beta blocker. So beta blocker should be actually the cornerstone of all arrhythmia as of in event 2022. Now we come to class three. Class three just increases the repolarization. So does it help? It doesn't have any effect on ERP or AP duration. So that's why uh, this is a drug which has been uh, come in recent future uh, and this is also the second most drug which is being used and that is called amiodarone. And this is the most common antiarrhythmic drug to suppress ventricular arrhythmia. But the problem of uh, amiodarone is, it is a potassium channel blocker as I told you, it decreases the potassium influx out so it prolongs the QT. So it actually prolongs the diastole. But by doing so, it has a major problem that it produces hemodynamic unstable uh, patient, you cannot give it. So in those cases, can you give lidocaine? No, you have to cardiovascular. That is the only thing. And uh, intravenous amiodarone is good to achieve a sinus rhythm in patient with a tracheal fibrillation. So if you get atrial fibrillation, presumably new in onset, if you have a ventricular arrhythmia, which the patient is tolerating, not hemodynamically compromised, give amiodarone. And you all know the smart dosing schedule of this amiodarone. You need not be worried about hypothyroidism or liver dysfunction or retinal deposit or liver function dysfunction or cutaneous uh, manifestation of this drug because they happen only on lung fibrosis in a high dose for a prolonged use. So in acute stage, it is really very used, but in prolonged stage, we usually give a very small dose. In my practice, in who are uh, free from atrial fibrillation, I give them 100 milligram twice a day, and I have found it uh, doesn't produce thyroid or other problems, although they have to be screened very carefully for this. Then the other drugs, Dorendron is a drug which is similar to amiodarone with less thyrotoxicosis and better tolerability, but uh, now it is uh, uh, not available because it uh, a FDA review doubles the rate of cardiovascular death, stroke, and heart failure in some patients who have a permanent atrial fibrillation who cannot be converted into atrial fibrillation. For sinus rhythm. So for paroxysmal A, probably this may be better than amiodarone. But again, uh, what do you think paroxysmal A may be intermittent or frequent A, and then it can produce as a cardiovascular problem. That's why drendarone still being a theoretical drug. Dofetilide uh, is being used for pharmacological cardiovascular of A. Uh, this drug, I have really some uh, good experience, although I used in a uh, very small dose, 40 milligram or 80 milligram twice daily, not 360 to 320 degree twice daily. Uh, but uh, with that, I have found a good class two and class three effect is associated with this. This is a wrong uh, statement, class two and class three both. 
So it's a non-cardio selective beta blocker and a potassium channel blocker. That's why it has a action of a beta blocker and the same time as action of amiodarone. It can be used for treatment of ventricular and supraventricular tachycardia. It is not effective for conversion of AF. And Sotalol also shows efficacy in suppressing here. So if I can tell you that in my practice, if you have a ventricular arrhythmia, symptomatic VPCs, I, I have found this is better than amiodarone. Uh, and the literature says equal uh, efficacy in the long term. So my feeling may not be equal with the literature because I have small number and they have started with the lab. Ibutilide is given intravenously for atrial uh, fibrillation or atrial fatter, and uh, it's good as a cardioversion uh, efficacy is concerned. The last group is the class four group. And uh, what the class four group is again more commonly used, DTH and verapamil, and they do only act mostly on the AV node. And so they are good in rate controlling. So these are the drugs which we give in patient with a mitral valve disease, rheumatic, atrial fibrillation, and fast ventricular. We are not supposed to give these things in patients who have a heart failure because these drugs are negative chronotropic value. They are indicated less commonly in heart failure in reduced ejection fraction. But with a preserve ejection fraction, that is ejection fraction of 50% and more, you can give it. But uh, they produce constipation and uh, probably uh, these are the drug which is uh, less used in clinical practice. Now, uh, there are certain things who are, uh, who are independent candidate. And now we talked about the standard parliamentary candidate. So there are new independent candidate. One is old, another is new. That is adenosine. Adenosine uh, can uh, produce a significant acute termination of supraventricular tachycardia. And this is the drug of choice in today's time. When you have a narrow QRS tachycardia, what I told you earlier, you don't know what is happening. So give adenosine. The only disadvantage of adenosine is that you have to give it to a central vein, preferably here. Ask the patient to keep your hand raised and give a flush. And 12 milligram you can give and it can just terminate the tachycardia. If it terminates, it is likely the tachycardia which can be ablated with radio frequency ablation in future is very high. Sometimes with a atrial flutter in patient with a uh, WPW, it can be degenerated into a more rapid QRS complex because it decreases the uh, Act, propagation to AV node. So you can have a more propagation into the side by side accessory part. So that is one thing in patient with WPW application process. And digoxin, as we know, everyone is uh, giving it. And again, it's good for the drug control, provided you give with beta blocker or non DHP calcium channel blocker. So in alone, digoxin is not useful anymore. Remember, very Now, there is an overview of the current pharmacological therapy. And this is also important to know in 2022, and this came just three years back. So, updated HCN channel blocker are uh, those which actually are the calcium channel blocker, uh, which is being uh, the sodium channel blocker, which we discussed right now. And they have been uh, basically uh, the source of their energy is adenosine phosphate. So they are called HCN channel mediated pacemaker current. And uh, so they decreases the spontaneous activation of the SA node in phase four of pacemaker depolarization, reducing the heart rate. And they don't wear, do anything possibly decrease the AV node and Parkinji fiber, but they are actually for the SA node. So if you wanted to decrease the SA node automatically, if you wanted to decrease the heart rate, because the heart rate cannot con be controlled, particularly in patient with angina and heart failure, the exercise heart rate has to be decreased. 
in addition to beta blocker this works if you ask me that whether it can be given alone in beta uh, without uh, beta blocker yes if the patient really cannot tolerate beta blocker because of fatigue you can give it but copd and asthma is not a contraindication for beta blocker in patient who has a heart failure so this is a new drug and which is a hcn uh, channel blocker so that is mean it's being actively only acting on the sinus node and some part of the av node which are being modi uh, just the pacemaker action no other action are there. and this vogen william seen classification already we have discussed one b one c one d very clearly and just i wanted to recapitulate where you are going to use quinidine disoparamide for supraventricular tachycardia but uh, rarely you need to give them until and unless you have uh, wanted to decrease the reduction of ectopic and ventricular automaticity so uh, supraventricular tachycardia these are drug not used these days but lidocaine mixolytin for ventricular tachycardia not for supraventricular tachycardia very clearly we need to understand so mixolytin is uh, available as mexohar 150 mg we are given in some patients our experience is limited because these patients are extremely sick and many of them succumbed in few years a uh, few months time propofenone and fecanamide uh, is uh, not to be used uh, very frequently if you have a structural heart disease and that is being very uh, typically again uh, we have decreased uh, told them earlier but otherwise for accessory pathway and all these things it is very good then there is another one d drug which has come which is ranolagin it again increases the atrial uh, depolarization that uh, phase 4 uh, phase 3 depolarization period of time that is the calcium opening becomes prolonged and that's why it is actually increases the diastolic period and that's why it is very good in stable angina ventricular tachycardia and there is a study which has shown that if you are giving this 440 50 mg of ranolazine the chances of recurrent ventricular tachycardia is decreased so in last few years the ibuprofen and ranolazine uh, we are definitely using also keeping in mind that they have a antiarrhythmic potentials now what are the other autonomic inhibitors or activator like like the beta blocker what we have discussed so beta blocker we all know and these are the beta blocker we use mostly carbidilol propranolol uh, bisoprolol and uh, although many a name has been written here isoprotonol only to be given is a permanent uh, for increasing the heart rate and uh, this we don't use digoxin we said earlier and adenosine as i told you can be given in patients we have a uh, supraventricular tachycardia and you wanted to rapidly uh, stop it remember the moment you uh, give adenosine the patient will say some chest discomfort and breathing difficulty that means probably you are successful because they uh, produces bronchoconstriction and uh, this is the reason that it's actually a uh, inhibitor of aminophylline or the vice versa aminophylline is the inhibitor of adenosine receptors the other group which has come also are this amiodarone dofetilide as we have this this is a one drug varna uh, kalter which will be a very good immediate conversion of atrial fibrillation not being used still in our country nicorandil is also like ranolagin increases the phase 2 but it doesn't have a very clear uh, anti arrhythmic uh, property in clinically uh, studies so uh, flecainide and propranolol the catecholamizing uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia is very important this is rare but uh, who which are the patients you will find the young women particularly and as i told you the drug abuser you can get a very frequent arrhythmias and uh, you can give can i for them and also for a long term maintenance of atrial fibrillation we give this medicine 
are very common. Now, the thing is, uh, we have seen that if the patient with heart failure are on good amount of AC inhibitor, they also have a decreased chances of arrhythmia. Similarly, if they have good uh, dose of pulsatan, RNA, so they actually decreases the chances of uh, ventricular, fatal ventricular arrhythmia to a large extent. Similarly, the omega-3 fatty acid, the new drug which has really has been shown in some cases, the post-myocardial infarction, sudden cardiac death being decreased. But there is a small study, we need more study because uh, omega-3 fatty acid is a very costly and it's a tasteless drug. And statin, one of its pleiotrophic effects is post-myocardial infarction reduction in SSD and because of decreased chances of ventricular arrhythmia. So this is the new definitions. And to end my talk, I wanted to tell you very clearly that uh, take one by one this medicine and where I used, I have been used diazopyramide in some patients who have a severe hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy with a calcium channel blocker and the beta blocker, they have not been able to manage. The PA interval still is in the normal limit and heart rate is above 60. 1B, lidocaine, we give in for ventricular VT strom who have presented with severe ventricular tachycardia which cannot be controlled with amiodarone or who have a uh, repetitive shock. In that case, we give some small dose, norad along with that we give lidocaine. And orally, if these patients still have this problem, we give uh, 150 milligram of mexalidin for a few days. And how many days, we don't know, because we don't really have a long experience on these things. Even the literature are silent on this. Phenidoin and tokenide have uh, never been used. And flakeride is been, or flakenamide is been used for uh, is can be taken as a peel of pop in the pocket. That means patient gets atrial fibrillation, but the structural heart disease is not there. Obvious that means doesn't have a heart failure, doesn't have a acute MI, or doesn't have a severe LV systolic dysfunction. And these are the drugs which can uh, give a rapid conversion of atrial fibrillation very nicely. Class two beta blocker bro is the most safe drug, particularly the metoprolol and uh, the bisoprolol and carbidolol in post myocardial infarction ventricular arrhythmia. Esmolol is the best for hypertensive emergencies and particularly in the neuro IC. Propranol is not an antiarrhythmic drug at all. It is best for patient who has a symptomatic VPCs. Many a young patient and will come, sir, I am missing my bed and I think that I am going to die soon. So you can give propranolol 20 milligram, 20 milligram twice daily. Continue for some days. It's not harm to give for a long time rather than giving them alprazolam or some sedatives. And it is also important to, uh, as a use in performance anxiety where you have too much performance anxiety. Sotalol I have used as a uh, as an alternative to amiodarone in patient where there is a dominant uh, documented hypothyroidism or uh, these are the only patient who may have given, uh, but otherwise not being used very commonly. Uh, the prolonged uh, amiodarone, as I told you, to prevent A, and in some patient with ventricular, frequent ventricular ectopy with LV dysfunction, you can give. Similarly, the dose of uh, sotalol, bretilium, and uh, ibutalide, and dofetide, I have a very minimum experience. I give Verapamil and diltiazem, not bepidril, is available in my country. And this drug I give in patients who have a normal LV function, pure normal LV function, but atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular death. So before I give this drug, I make it sure that the patient is having a normal LV function. And a few of my patients who has a significant mitral null disease and uh, uncontrolled ventricular rate, we are giving verapamil, tiltiagen, beta blocker, deoxin, all at the same time. But remember, if you combine these two, the deoxin and verapamil or tiltiagen, the chances of toxicity is very high. So the take-home message, uh, this is not very clearly seen. So 
the most important optimal prescription joint when the drug therapy is your judgment and individualizing drug therapy is pivotal in achieve desired therapeutic effect but remember the chances that you are going to be benefiting this patient with antiarrhythmic drug in the long term is less until only antiarrhythmic drug which has been shown to be effective in clinical practice is beta blocker beta blocker and beta blocker not anything else thank you thank you sir for your excellent speech and uh, we have uh, you don't need mention special mention that you have done your in bm from pgi and with multiple fellowships and with your ex extensive knowledge in this uh, domain of cardiology and your added experiences you have given a very fine uh, picture of the uses of uh, antiarrhythmics but uh, you we also have gained a few added information regarding the newer ventures yes uh, newer classification of the antiarrhythmics as well as the use of ibuprofen ranolazine and also um, the some of the contraindications in some cases like flaconide should where there is contra in it, it is contraindicated in structural anomalies of the heart or uh, we should always be uh, regarding amiodarone though it is so uh, very important drug regarding uh, for prolonged uh, antiarrhythmic use in the uh, in uh, anti as, as a uh, when we need for prolonged therapy amiodarone is very much used but we should be careful regarding this um, um, arrhythmia regarding this uh, it might have this prolonged qt it is in uh, contraindicated we should be aware of this uh, some of these experience very informative and uh, we will now go to any questions uh, which are open here um, for uh, sir's uh, answer so i would uh, ask shambhu to moderate if there's any questions from our uh, other end i mean from the pgt yeah, okay part. Th yes. Thank you, ma thank you, madam. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful lecture. As always, we are really grateful to you, sir. So, uh, one question, sir, uh, from my side. There are lots of patients we are seeing who has right bundle branch block, and the patient has a background ischemic heart disease, uh, maybe heart failure. So, what is your comment on uh, using beta blocker in this type of in this group of patients? And uh, also, sir. can you also please uh, let us know uh, what is why we are ex uh, exactly not using beta blockers in patients who are who having left bundle branch block but with a good heart rate and also has some sometimes in patients who has left bundle branch block there is also some tachycardia also we we had found and the patient obviously we we think that that left bundle branch block means there is a background ischemic heart disease also and uh, so so your take on this sir using beta blockers in uh, right bundle branch block and then left bundle branch block patient thanks I, i i think i should have mentioned it but i forgot actually the important point my my take on this is that first of all if somebody has come with the right bundle branch block uh, or even left bundle branch block and just a ecg manifestation the normal lv function they don't have any symptom they have hypertension suppose so uh, we may not give beta blocker as in this sort of patients where we need a anti hypertensive drug and although we know that the beta blocker is not the first class of anti hypertensive drug at the present moment but beta blocker in this sort sort of population should be chosen less because many of these patients uh, can degenerate it into a complete heart block and your beta blocker can unmask it and then you can wait for some time so this is the only uh, case where you should avoid or try to defer beta blocker therapy in patient with a normal ejection fraction right bundle branch or left bundle branch and even with trifascicular block rbb lbb and some full pr interval pr 200 millisecond something like that now suppose this patient comes with a ejection fraction of 35% with a left bundle branch block i look into the pr interval if the pr interval is less than 200 or 200 millisecond i start with the small doses of beta blocker 
and try to find out his uh, resting heart rate and the heart rate with exercise. If the heart rate with uh, in my chamber for after a couple of work, the, it increased up to 70, 80. I, uh, and the PR interval is normal. I try to escalate slowly because the beta blocker is in the long term is going to prevent sudden cardiac death. Suppose this patient has a history of SIMCO and then uh, the LVB is there and the LV dysfunction is there. This is the patient who needs a biventricular pacemaker. Suppose the patient have a LV dysfunction and right bundle branch block. Again, you need to give beta blocker in small dose and increases at maximum tolerable dose. In right bundle branch block patient with LV dysfunction, you should delay uh, the pacemaker venture because they really don't get much benefit because remember one thing, we are giving beta blocker to prevent uh, their future probability of sudden death, decreasing the ventricular uh, size, that is reverse remodeling, and uh, to increase the effort tolerance in the long term. So beta blocker has to be given and we are not giving, giving it, it's our therapeutic anesthesia and it's a good that you raise this thing in our platform. So my take is all post MI with bundle branch block, Yes, they should receive beta blocker until and unless contraindicated. Suppose you need a beta blocker and the patient's heart rate is falling, you give a pacemaker support. And there are a lot of pacemaker where the pacemaker can be smartly dealt with. But beta blocker uh, should not be uh, replaced with any other drug that is amiodarone for in these patients. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Because there is lots of confusion in these regards among physicians also. So another question asked by Dr. Chiranji Bakchi that can metoprolol be used interchangeably with propranolol in young persons with occasional ectopics with sinus tachycardia and anxiety along with anxiolytics? Uh, Dr. Chiranji, what is my practice in these cases? These are the patients who are coming very frequently, like those who are working in IT and all. So uh, uh, there are definite role of yoga in preventing the frequent ectopic that we have to address first also. And uh, instead of if your, your propranol has not worked, you can give metaprolol and metaprolol tartarate, small dose, succinate need not be given, 25 milligram twice daily, even if they have a problem in their sexual health, you can give just 25 milligram once daily. Yes, you can give it and I, I give it frequently. Thank you, sir. So you. now we also have Professor Partho Ray from yes, UK. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, sir. so may I ask Professor Partho Ray to unmute yourself and Yes, he's a noted neurologist. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. And, uh, and may... no, yeah, yeah. It, uh, thank so, you very much. Yeah. If you uh, have any comment or question, sir, please go yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I joined this because I was always weak, and I could never remember the classification of antiarrhythmic drugs and their application in clinical practice. Going back to 1996, when I was a senior house officer all the cardiac arrhythmias that used to come to the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, through Leeds General Infirmary, we used to have long lines and immediately insert them and start infusing amiodarone. That was the apparently panacea. So I think I went off on a very poor start in England, giving antiarrhythmic therapy because everything that came through the door was given amiodarone. And in my pharmacology days, 1987, we learned this classification. So there was a clear mismatch between the mode of action, the channels, and the clinical application at the bedside. Any arrhythmia, it, uh, I mean, supraventricular, ventricular, give amiodarone, and then we'll see. And usually 1996, 97, 98, amiodarone was the panacea for everything. So... My question to you, and so that was my first observation I'm making, just from a you know old man's perspective. The second thing was that beta blockers have been traditionally avoided, avoided by I'm not sure about cardiologists, but by everybody else in regards to asthma, COPD, 
all the other side effects that you just mentioned for the IT uh, individuals, including for heart block that it might cause. And you know, precipitating left bundle branch block or you know, complete heart block, we have always avoided big doses of beta blockers for some peculiar reason. So, and now then again came the devices for the management of arrhythmias. I'm, I'm just taking you through my levels of uncertainty, which is why this subject I came just to learn, uh, uh, to revise myself, to see if my you know, experience could help me understand it better. It hasn't, by the way. I'm still in the same dark cloud as I was before, because all these thoughts are going through my mind. And I'm asking this question to possibly ask you to clarify these devices came and then all the medicines were necessary because we could have uh, ICD. And you know, I was again in Leeds with John Perrins who first inserted the first ICD in UK, uh, a huge device about, you know, about two kilograms in the gentleman's abdomen. And every time it gave a shock, the patient's whole body lifted off the bed. And we actually saw him, there's a famous patient. It was the very first bio, bioengineering product. And now we have got small you know, devices. Yes, yes, yes. So pharmacology, non-pharmacology management of all sorts of cardiac arrhythmias. Now we have been distinguishing between you know, niche things, which is for the specialist. So what I want from you, if possible, is actually uh, you know, a guideline for non-cardiologists. If there is any on European stroke website, which I've just seen, I remember, I don't have, uh, I mean, I don't think they have a particular, you know, uh, guideline which is strict about what condition clinical give which drug like that. There's a lot of variation between, you know, cardiology specialists like you. Could we have that? That will help, I think, a lot of practicing non-cardiologists manage arrhythmias in the first instance before they come and see you, one. Then this uh, beta blocker mystery that has persisted reluctance of use so let me ask these two questions to you i've said a yeah. lot of things okay. <laughs> no no first of all we start with beta blocker number one number one uh, beta blocker uh, the irony is that the patient who are most sick in the form of more breathing difficulty more advanced heart failure with reduced ejection fraction that is less than 50 percent or even more the lower the ejection fraction, even at the patient who has an ejection fraction of 20%, he's the person who is going to be benefited with beta blocker. Now, the thing is, uh, uh, the therapeutic inertia comes because uh, we are not in touch with these uh, issues and the uh, fear of criticism in this country. Uh, and the other uh, reason is that the art of uh, starting the beta blocker. It has to be started very slow and go slow. So low and slow is the dictum. That means if you're giving metaprolol start in a very sick patient, maybe with 12.5 milligram and next five, seven days, you can give up to 25 milligram, then wait for three, four weeks. And before you go into 37.5, similarly for bisoprolol, if the patient is on the uh, uh, borderline blood pressure zone, try to avoid uh, carvedilol. Now, uh, apart from this carvedilol, bisoprolol, metaprolol, succinate, no other drug has been shown to be uh, have a mortality benefit except uh, nevipolol to some extent, uh, uh, so far as cardiovascular uh, outcome is concerned. Now, if you have an angina also, particularly you have two sort of angina you can have in your country patient with a vasospastic angina who have a Reynolds phenomena where you cannot give beta blocker. That's a different thing. But otherwise, majority of the patient who have exertional angina, that is a fixed threshold angina, beta blocker should come first in the therapeutic armamentarium. Now, the thing is, you need to read the ECG and until and unless the patient has a recurrent syncope with the advanced AV block, that is uh, LVB with recurrent syncope, uh, RBB with either anterior or posterior fascicular block with the recurrent syncope with the self-injury, then probably you need to have a pacemaker support before you go with a beta blocker. But otherwise, beta blocker, oh, is it true that after you give beta blocker, the patient chances of pacemaker implantation increases? No. Beta blocker unmasks the cardiac problem because if you have a bad muscle, your electrical system also at fault. So um, there is nothing wrong in your prescription. 
So how I monitor, I monitor just the PR interval. So long the PR interval is not increasing, I go on increasing the dose of the beta blocker, particularly in patient with a heart failure with reduced rejection fraction and who are the junk of the patient uh, who will fall into the discussions of the today's topic that is anti-arrhythmias issues. Because they are the patient who are going to die of arrhythmia, not a person who is stable is going to be uh, dying of arrhythmia. The second question of amiodarone, amiodarone is a only drug which has been shown to decrease the uh, rapidly the sinus rhythm in patients who are not hemodynamically unstable, be it ventricular tachycardia or it is supraventricular tachycardia, which you may not be able to recognize clinically uh, and you are in doubt that it may be SVT, it may be VT and amiodarone is a very safe drug to acutely terminate and that's the reason of large <laughs> uh, needle and giving amiodarone and uh, for last three decades it's still uh, popular as an antiarrhythmic drug. The important thing is after you have treated the patient acutely your smart approach has to understand that this patient is receive amiodarone here or out of the hospital. And for that, you need to compare with the previous ECG, take the patient's uh, uh, detailed blood report. And remember, beta blocker long-term therapy can increase the uh, life expectancy. Amiodarone doesn't increase the life expectancy, uh, except in few uh, discrete studies. This is my take. So it's not the specialist and it's not the general practitioner's view. The general practitioner also need to insist on the cardiologist, please give beta blocker or increase. I am going to monitor, not a problem. Thank you, sir. So now may I request Dr. Chatterjee? I think the, there is some question asked yes. by Dr. Chatterjee. Would you please uh, unmute yourself and can I ask the question to doc directly? Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, Shunibda, this is Chandan. Um, Tell me. Uh, I met you in the Tata Medical Center. We end up both yes. in the same yes. room. I think you can recognize me. So uh, my question is uh, basically uh, related to a clinical problem. Uh, the problem is uh, the patient is having paroxysm of supraventricular tachycardia as for the, uh, I mean, the diagnosis done by the cardiologist. And then uh, he went for uh, that radio frequency ablation or electrophysiology both in Kolkata, and it was done by, I'm not naming that person. And uh, then uh, uh, he was given, it was, it failed. And uh, after the failure, actually uh, uh, the person started getting flicate, the combination of flicanide and uh, metoprolol. And then uh, the person went to CMC Velour. So in the CMC Velour, uh, this, I mean, they also tried, and I have seen the whole thing. I mean, the, the way they have done it, they are actually producing the uh, kind of impulse generating it. And uh, I mean, they are producing tachycardia and trying to stop it at a different level. But the thing is, uh, th that is again a failure. And what they did, uh, the patient is now uh, quite comfortable. What they did, they just have changed the doses of uh, flicanide and metoprolol. I mean, metoprolol was given here at the dose of around 50 milligram and flicanide probably 25 or something like that. They just have increased the dose of flicanide and reduced the dose of metoprolol and patient is more or less okay. Initially, he had an attack of around uh, three, three attacks of palpitation in a day, but after getting this kind of modification of the dose, uh, he is okay. Now, now, my question is, is there a standard guideline regarding this kind of phenomenon where the, the failure of radio frequency ablation is happening and uh, where, I mean, all the doctors should prescribe the same dose to all the patients. Yeah, <laughs> no, these are rare phenomena, but what is happening, I tell you, uh, okay. that after a radio frequency ablation uh, with even the modern technique, you can have a pericardial uh, uh, accessory pathway. Okay. So, as we traditionally know that muscle in the middle, endocardium carries the electricity and epicardium carries the great vessel. But sometimes you can have a preponderance of electrical uh, fiber gathering in the pericardium. And that's the reason they fail to terminate in the uh, table. 
But after uh, termination in the table, if it is recurs, it is usually because of fibrosis in their areas and which can be easily mapped. And the second procedure is eventless and they most of the time are uh, okay. Now in this, your case was has happened that uh, it never being able to succeed because of the presence of the pericardial uh, areas and which uh, at the present moment uh, doing a pericardiosynthesis in a uh, pericardium which is not filled with uh, fluid is uh, difficult and mapping is a difficult issue. So probably it will be sorted out. So in that case, what they have done, they have measured the uh, interval between the uh, conduction time between the sinus node, AV node, going through the AV node. And if these nodes showing normal activity, there is no prolongation of uh, activities, which is uh, the part of electrophysiological study, they can confidently increase the uh, doses of any one of them. There is no standard protocol of combining flecainamide with propranol. Uh, it's not like that. Yeah. And uh, if, if, if expert physiologists may be doing it, but there is uh, traditionally in textbook, no standard protocol like this. Okay. But clinically you can increase up to a maximum tolerable dose and tolerable dose again is being decided by the PR interval. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Meeting you after a long time. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So may I request now, Professor Robindranath Chatterjee is there. So, sir, you actually, sir, uh, had taken our previous class on antiarrhythmic pharmacology. So, sir, if, if you have any comment yes, to sir. make, sir. Please. Am I audible? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes. <clears throat> now, it's very nice to interact with Dr. Banerjee because yes. this is a sort of integration, which is the main theme of medical education today through CISP and RBCW, we are thinking always for integration. Now, this is one sort of what Dr. Sambo has done, vertical integration. And what I told in my last class, here the collaboration with the clinical is a very nice for the listeners. What was taught in the pharmacology, it is about 80% or if not 90% is matching with the clinical pharmacology as taught by you. Uh, it would have been better that if I could discuss with you earlier, then what happened, whatever things you have missed, I would have asked that you can add this one. Whichever I missed, you could have told me, yes, sir, you add these things. So that would have been a better presentation for both of us because we had no idea the Ramanajin is having some antiarrhythmic effect. But you have told, so this one in our pharmacology book, it has not come. It, is, yeah. uh, it has come as, uh, as anti-anginal, but not by, so this is a good thing. It is added in our uh, network. Hmm. So anyway, it's a good presentation. One thing uh, may you probably intentionally you have omitted, you have mainly, mainly concerned with rapid action potential you have thought. But slow action potential may be intentionally you have omitted. Yes, yes, in, yes. Uh, but that it will be difficult. So difficult, I, yeah. I, I know. Because calcium channel blockers, they mainly affect the slow action potential because they do not affect the rapid action potential or fast action potential. That one. So by that, it's a very nice presentation. We had <laughs> nice evening today. Thank you very much. And uh, we will have a more... Uh, the case based and uh, see the uh, yeah, yeah. fatty acid, uh, omega 3 fatty acid, ranulazine, statin, and all these actually there are some abstract which has been published in ESC or uh, somewhere. Okay. Yeah, like yeah, other those things. So, uh, the, 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 the evidence is less, but the thing is, more importantly, we understand need to understand that rather than giving costly medicine in patient who have a structural heart disease. Yes, yes. It is better to give evidence-based medicine in the full dose. Full dose. And uh, Dr. Lopamudra has asked about the non-pharmacological maneuver. So uh, definitely uh, patient who can do at home for recurrent peri predictable PSBT or failed uh, radio frequency ablation is induced vomiting and uh, keeping uh, uh, 
some ice in the throat and uh, that really helps in some of the cases and the peel off in the pocket concept will be better that you give uh, take flaconide or even you can take uh, propofenol when it is available in your uh, and then you can take it even the doctor is not available Thank you, sir. Just I wanted to know, so do you consider beta blockers as a safe uh, antiarrhythmic? Is it a dictum or uh, depending upon the cases, on the specific case? Beta lock. Beta blockers. Beta, beta blockers. blockers. No, no, no. Beta, beta blockers are the gold standard even for uh, PSBD. There is nowhere it is written that you have to give calcium channel blocker because why paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia comes? We all in 24 hours halter will have some amount of ventricular premature beats. So if you have a parallel two fiber, which is running slow and which is running fast, the PVC comes and he finds which road is open. And he automatically finds a path which has a uh, early recovery and it picks up and go to the distal muscle bed and comes back retrogradely and that's how the sarcasm movement comes. So here, the AV nodal blockage with a uh, 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 calcium channel blocker is useful, but at the same time, if you're giving a beta blocker prophylactically, it is also useful. So it's, uh, it's, it's actually useful in all the arrhythmias. Regarding post myocardial infarction uh, arrhythmias, we, uh, we give metoprolol. Uh, would which uh, for how long can it be continued, or would you prefer amiodarone in the lead later uh, to add on? When I think about amiodarone in a patient who is receiving beta blocker, these are the candidate for AICD clearly, because they have a syncope or uh, frequent ventricular ectopics, and uh, the the number of these patients are low. Second thing is these are the patients who are so sick that they don't make it. Their survival is also very blink. But if a patient has a, uh, any myocardial infection, anterior lateral or anything, I give for one year and try to find out his ejection fraction. If the ejection fraction is uh, borderline most of the times, that and there are some atrial dilatation, some borderline ventricular dilatation, I continue beta blocker lifelong because uh, what is being observed in my registry that if you are giving beta blocker for a long time after five years down the line you can see the qrs has not been widened so uh, in our day-to-day uh, -day practice uh, rather than doing a eco uh, you, if you can see the qrs is not increasing in uh, width it, it, that means the patient is not deteriorating clinically. So that is the, the, goal, the best way to prove it. And we have seen patients who are taking even uh, uh, 125 or 150 milligram of uh, metoprolol succinate. Uh, 200 milligram is the maximum dose. I have rarely used it. But 100 to 150, many of people are taking. Similarly, bisoprolol 7.5 milligram are taking and they do definitely uh, better in the long term. And carvedilol, again, I am saying I have nothing against it, but what I have found because of its additional vasodilatory property, it decreases the blood pressure. And you know, our patients are sensitive to blood pressures. So they complain that my PP is low, and then you cannot increase the dose of uh, carvedilol in a long term. But apart from that, one thing, although it is not related directly to antiarrhythmic drug, but as Dr. Partho is there, we need to understand very clearly that we should not forget to give anticoagulation in patient who has a high risk of stroke with atrial fibrillation, even if it is paroxysmal. And there are, this is probably the more important thing also to be discussed in other points, in other uh, forum. Thank so you. just one question more. Yes. That, uh, regarding this follow-up, when you give uh, beta blockers, uh, follow-up uh, at what interval would you advise uh, this ECG or ECO to be uh, done? ECG, uh, if I am giving uh, in a patient where I feel that the patients need to be, has a already a uh, bundle branch block and I am giving it, I try to repeat the ECG at two weeks time. And if I found if it has increased, I don't increase the beta blocker. I try to tell them to uh, record your heart rate and blood pressure and give back after two, three months. 
uh, increasing the beta blocker and reversing the heart failure echocardiography takes some time. So twi uh, twice in a year is sufficient, not more than that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So uh, I think Professor Parthore uh, has uh, yes, raised his uh, hand. Uh, yeah. yes. two, two questions, sir. Uh, yes. uh, one question was that I remembering about one patient I have seen. Uh, uh, that person was on bisoprolol 10 milligram, which is from what I've written down a class two drug. And yes. then that person is also receiving ranolazine 375 BD, which also has got class two effects in addition to anti diabetic effects of ranolazine as well, in addition to anti anginal effects and anti arrhythmic effects. So, combining two phase two, uh, you know, class two drugs, beta blockers, Bisoprolol at a quite a high dose, 10 milligrams, as well as 75, 375 milligrams BD of ranulosin. Is that asking for some sort of you know trouble at AV nodal conduction level? Or no, no, no. Yeah, basically, it 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 will uh, it should not produce, uh, but we need to uh, check for uh, symptom and the PR interval prolongation. Yeah. I had one patient who had a uh, syncope and we found in the halter there are sinus pause but there is no peer interval prolongation so uh, this this is can be given definitely but ranolazine uh, in patient who uh, has uh, this patient must have angina so these are the patients who actually until and unless they do the exercise the purpose of combining these two drug is to increase the effort tolerance so over a period of time, we also presume that one of the drug uh, can be either withdrawn ranolazine or the beta blocker can be de-escalated if the patient can increase his uh, physical activity. I found this session very interesting. And, and, and you know, uh, Professor Chattopadhyay, yourself, Professor Choudhury, if we had this sort of exposure, combination of clinicians and pharmacologists at third year, fourth year levels, for only some niche topics, you know, which have got a direct clinical application, which is easy to understand, will be helpful, will stimulate interest, will make it practical. So a suggestion, it can be done at RG core level where, you know, the, your local cardiologist, which is I think Parto Karmukar, can come over and, you know, uh, give a correlation or even if Professor Banerjee finds some time can interact. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I think that will make third year, fourth year pharmacology learning much more exciting, interesting and interactive and more, it will remain in, in and the brain. Probably, probably uh, sorry to interrupt. So no, no, please I also don't. think so, that this pharmacological discussion, what I read uh, for preparation of this lecture or passing the DM was becoming less burdensome for me than what it was being taught uh, in my third year in Kilkata Medical College. I found it very difficult. I cannot understand what is class 1, B, O, and <laughs> you have to always I just remember. But now you don't remember anything. You can visualize it. So if it helps the younger population, that will be good for the all of us. Yeah, as I said, I mean, I didn't understand anything at that time. Uh, so I think that's a our examples are i think are, there are is one question uh, yes sir, dr chiyanji has said chiyanji it chiyanji so you can unmute yourself sir uh, yeah, to oh, ask sorry. the question yeah so he has said a uh, atrial fibrillation with heart rate preserve with right bundle branch work what is the first drug so these are the drug patients mostly you need to understand this patient can have a uh, right uh, asd atrial septal defect where actually the heart rate is controlled or preserved means that probably the AV node also at geoparty. So atrial fibrillation, definite atrial fibrillation with a control ventricular rate below 100 uh, has a speculation this patient has a coexisting AV block. Now, the thing is that I am not going to do anything until and unless the patient is having an exertional increase in heart rate. If it is increasing, then again, beta blocker. And uh, NOAC, absolutely, yes. And the other thing is, uh, so there is no harm in giving beta blocker in this patient. The right bundle branch block is uh, not a contraindication. But the more important thing is that our, our, our RBV with atrial fibrillation may indicate a bad right ventricle also, uh, either a effect of idiopathic or uh, uncertain pulmonary hypertension and LV dis RB dysfunction or previous right ventricular cardiomyopathy or, uh, myocardial infarction or RB cardiomyopathy. So we need to exclude those things. 
but most commonly in elderly patient with atrial fibrillation uh, right ventral branch block the first time you can detect the asd where it has been missed earlier so here you uh, need not give any drug until and unless patient has a palpitation if the patient has a palpitation do a ecg and find out what is happening is it a pause or it is a tachycardia oh thank you sir actually uh, can i uh, uh, comment in this regard because this was a patient with having uh, is a age of uh, 65 65 years uh, may, uh, female and uh, she was undergone an echo and there was no structural heart disease as uh, as you said sir but uh, so surprisingly one physician uh, prescribed her with uh, metoprolol 50 mg and but uh, she develops a dizziness and some uh, you know uh, for that reason she, uh, he has also prescribed and uh, motivated her to have a pacemaker but subsequently the uh, with uh, from, um, an in detailed investigations like echocardiography and seen by a specialist cardiologist that metoprolol dose has been reduced 25 mg from 50 and actually her problem was recurrent palpitation and but uh, she was also a bit uh, anxious anxiety prone and with ibs and this kind of things but without any structural heart disease only palpitation was the main symptoms with occasional dizziness and uh, now actually the uh, she is uh, uh, anxious about the probability of implanting a pacemaker in the future but the cardiologist advised her not, not to implant a pacemaker only go with the 25 mg of metoprolol and with um, uh, regular monitoring and if there is increased pause and this thing as you as you have suggested said then only uh, pacemaker will be yes. more importantly this patient needs a noac I yes, know yes, also yes noac has been prescribed by that physician cardiologist that's that's that's, that's, that's noac prescription and noac follow up is more important than putting mm -hmm. a pacemaker <laughs> exactly. so thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you once again thank so you. i i think all the delegates will be very much uh, or immensely help uh, got, got help from your wonderful lecture and i think now it's uh, almost 9:56 and professor parthore is there so he is uh, always uh, scolding teacher to us uh, because anything more than 10 then our we should obey our parasympathetic nervous system and <laughs> <laughs> go to sleep so i think i just uh, emphasize I also, the value of sleep yeah, yeah, i just I emphasize always, the value I, of I, sleep because my yeah, friends yeah, and boys up till 2 o'clock in the morning otherwise i will get yeah, lots absolutely. of scolding so with that i just want to ask uh, professor lopa mudra choudhury madam to conclude today's wonderful session over yes, to madam it was, uh, it was a very interesting and interactive uh, session and we are really grateful to dr uh, shunip banerji sir and also for we are also grateful to uh, professor parthoroy for joining in and it was very intense uh, we are also indebted to our sir our respected rn uh, chatterji sir he is our respected teacher and it was a very nice session and uh, we are also grateful to shambh who has organized it so efficiently and we are looking forward for many such sessions in future thank you sir thank you madam thank you sir thank you all the respected delegates and we are also really thankful to inovo care e academy and inovo care health of solution mm -hmm. for providing this e platform to present this today's wonderful topic once again thank you all on behalf of ips west bengal chapter i wishing you a uh, good night good night good night good night thank you dr banerjee